there's a way to make an entrance. <laughs> My destiny. It was now a conspiracy of witches. Download Veely today. Of all of West Africa, Senegal is perhaps the country that has been most affected by the environmental changes which are impacting on our oceans. Subjected to the wrath Mother Nature is unleashing on us, this seafaring people have a dilemma to face. Should they take to the open seas or stay put? Why go and kill yourself looking for work elsewhere? Wherever there is water, sunshine and the strength to work, there is a chance for development. From the meandering Saloon River to the banks of the Pink Lake, armed only with their courage, these men and women are fighting to protect their homeland. They are the Sentinels of Senegal. Posted like a lookout at the river mouth and battered by the ocean waves, San Louis gazes out over the Atlantic, protective of its former glory. Fight Her Bridge, built at the end of the 19th century, bears witness to a time when San Louis reigned over the African colonies. It was a major trading post. Gum Arabic passed through here in transit before being shipped to Europe. When Senegal gained independence in 1960, Dakar became the capital and the island of San Louis gradually fell into a state of slumber. This city radiates an old-fashioned charm, which is perhaps less due to its architectural heritage than to the people of San Louis themselves. Put some grease on it. Some oil. And clean it. Mesa Fall is 54. Assisted by his son Petit Jean, he runs a bicycle repair shop in San Louis. You need to have a love of cleaning bicycles. It's important to love what you do. That's why you need to caress them. If you caress them, you'll end up loving them. You must love what you do. It's part of the job. Yeah. Maisafal is a mechanic, but he's so much more than that. Wolof and French-speaking, a sculptor and a poet, he is a local celebrity in San Louis. I landed on this island of Saint Louis in a boat. That beautiful boat was my mother. And its handsome skipper was my father. He was a bicycle repairer, like his father. And he passed the skill on to me on this island of St. Louis, where I've only ever been surrounded by bicycles. I spent the days when there was no school at the workshop, because I was a very disruptive child, and my old man didn't want me playing with the others and doing any damage, so I stayed by his side, and after every repair, he gave me a rag and said, Mesa, clean this bicycle. So I did. I made quick work of the cleaning because my friends were nearby and I wanted to go and play with them. And I'd say, Dad, come and see, it's clean. And he'd say, look at the chain, the gears, the cogs, the spokes and the hub. That needs a good clean too, my sir. I hated the object I was cleaning. So I transformed it in my mind's eye because it was stopping me from going out to play with the others. I turned it into a, a bird or a person. We rarely got any customers because when I repair a bicycle, I do it in such a way that the customer's not going to be coming back in a hurry. The days passed. And the saying goes that when you have nothing to do, you make art. Since I had stored up all those images in my head from when I was a little kid, I thought, why not do something with them? And that is how it started. Armed with a supply of parts accumulated over three generations, Mesa heads off to his welding workshop to produce a new work of art that he plans to install in the city centre. A 
Saint Louis. In Saint Louis, there is the river, the sea, the buildings, and the people. Everything in Saint Louis inspires me. Saint Louis' heritage is at risk because there's an anarchy here. People are building any old house. A lot of houses have been abandoned because their owners are now in Dakar. But thankfully, there are buildings such as the Photography Museum, which have been nicely renovated. Yeah, yeah it's a very pretty building. I love these red bricks. They were made in Bukucho. There was a kiln there where they made these bricks, then they were transported here by boat. They were brought here to build these beautiful houses. This is an example of how, if the houses are renovated nicely like this one, the town would regain its splendor of old. I see a guardian of the temple, a sentinel of our heritage, informing people about these beautiful buildings that we risk losing in this city of Saint Louis, and telling them to be careful not to destroy the legacy of our grandparents. The beautiful city of San Louis has two faces. On its island, situated in the middle of the Senegal River, the old colonial town dreams of its former glory. Opposite, wedged in between the river and the ocean, is one of the most densely populated places in Senegal, Get Dar, the fishermen's quarter. Get down if you're finished. Push it. Push it into the water. That pirog is going to Mauritania. He's going to Mauritania to look for fish. There are no fish here anymore. Fish is expensive now. At the shipyard in Geddar, Mr. Diop is hard at work. Since retiring, this former fisherman has branched out into decorating pirogues. Are you nearly finished? Almost. Diop, write the name of my mother on it. Maimon Aydara. Maimon Aydara, all right. Whenever I've named a boat after my mother, it's brought me luck and I've had good catches. I've called all my boats Maimon Aydara ever since. I've just come back from Mauritania, where the fishing boats are all painted specific colours. All the pirogues are brown there. But I'm back now. 
And tomorrow I'm going fishing. So I'm getting my boat repainted with the colors from home. Whenever you see a pirogue with a pattern on it like this, you know it comes from St. Louis. The blue at the front of the pirogue is the arches of the Feder Bridge, which is our emblem. The grey painting means happiness. That's the fisherman returning home to rest. He's happy. He's made enough money to feed himself and his family. It represents happiness and money. It's done. You can climb aboard. When I finish the job, I like to see the reaction of the owner, to find out whether he's happy with my work. That gives me pleasure. Then I know I've done a good job. There are lots of motifs that are specific to St. Louis. I'm keeping the tradition alive, just as our ancestors did. But unfortunately, there's a lot less work now than there used to be. I was born here, and when I was a child, the river was my playground. There used to be a big gap between the river and the sea. It took ages to cross Gouet Nadar on foot. But today the sea is advancing fast and ravaging everything. When the sea destroys the fishermen's houses, they can't afford my services anymore. Mr. Diop has good reason to worry. Gouet Dar and its inhabitants are seriously threatened by global warming and the inexorable rise of the sea level. Season after season, tide after tide, the Atlantic Ocean is devouring the coastline and terrorizing the inhabitants of Geddah. Barely three months ago, the greedy waves carried away dozens more houses, leaving their inhabitants distraught and homeless. Every year, the Atlantic Ocean becomes more voracious and human endeavors to save the area don't stand a chance. The environmental threat hanging over Senegal can be explained by its geography. Situated in the heart of West Africa, Senegal covers an area of about 200,000 square kilometers, less than half the surface area of France. Bordered on the whole of its west side by the Atlantic Ocean, Senegal is above all a country of fishermen, and most of the population is concentrated along the coastline. Dula people from Casamance in the south, Serer people in the center, and Wolof people in the north are all subjected to the caprices of nature, which is retaliating blow for blow what it has suffered at the hands of humans. Board Mayumana Adara, Pap Lamine and his son are heading out to haul in the nets like they do every day. Come on, pull, pull. Faster, faster. Go on, go on, go on, go on, go on, go on. Go on. We're fishing for sole. Sole is pretty much all there is at the moment. But it's it's not a good catch. We should have landed more fish than that. I've been fishing since 1982. Uh, and my son was practically born at sea. It's hard work and there are lots of accidents. It's not easy working here. The sea is becoming more and more violent. Climate change isn't the only reason for the increasingly rough seas of the Atlantic Ocean. The Long de Barberie, this long sandbank on which Geddar is built, in the past 
stretched for several dozen kilometers south, forming a rampart against the ocean. But in 2003, to protect San Luis from flooding from the Senegal River, the authorities dug a four meter wide breach in the sandbank, unintentionally opening up the Pandora's box. Today, the breach measures seven kilometers and is widening day by day. This environmental disaster has proved to be a life sentence for Paplamin's village, situated opposite. The same tidal wave that carried away part of Gedda also devastated his house. Ever since, Pap and the 22 people who depend on him have been camping in his garden. It was sunset. A wave came and destroyed the wall. It swept through the house and destroyed all the rooms. There was nothing we could do. We had to leave. We were lent another house. Or all the neighbors came to help us get our things out. Very difficult time for us. These freak waves started coming last year. The sea destroyed our house the first time. We rebuilt it, then it happened again this year. We're very worried, because if it happens again, we won't be able to carry on repairing the house forever. Every evening at 7 o'clock, we move out. We don't sleep here anymore, because we're too scared of the sea. Tonight, like every other night, Paplamin and his family are leaving their house to go and spend the night with friends far away from the coast. We are threatened from both sides, from the city and from the ocean. That's why I've made this piece, this river sentinel, to tell people to be vigilant, like this sentinel on the banks of the Senegal River. For me, an artist is someone who reflects on things for himself, for his town, for his country, for Africa, for the whole world. That's what it means to me. I've played my part. Yeah. Before flowing into the Atlantic Ocean in San Luis, the Senegal River irrigates the plains in the north of the country and marks out the border with the Mauritanian Desert. Its nourishing waters serve as a sanctuary for widgeons and flamingos and provide an oasis in the middle of the Sahelian Desert. San Luis and the river mouth mark the northern limit of the Grand Cut. Along this 150-kilometer stretch of coastline, the same problems of coastal erosion and overfishing recur. At the other end of the country is the city of Dakar and the Cape Verde Peninsula, a conglomeration of three million inhabitants. That's a lot of mouths to feed for the men and women of Kayar, Senegal's largest fishing port. Hello. 
It is 8 o'clock a.m. The pirogues head out, passing those returning from fishing trips which have lasted all night or even several days. Eliman is a child of K.R. He is the son of a fisherman and a fisherman himself. Returning from a night at sea, he endeavors to make ends meet by helping to unload the fish, like hundreds of other youngsters from K.R. Empty it from this side. Hurry up. I like the sea where I spent my childhood. We spent all our time playing on the beach. It was our playground. When the pirogues came in, they were full of fish. But in 2006, the Senegalese government signed a fishing agreement with the Europeans. Big trawlers came here to fish and they took everything. We used to fish two or three kilometers from the shore. Now we have to go much further and there are no fish left. Plus, the population here has increased a lot. Before, there were only 200 to 300 pirogues. Now there are 6,000 here in Kaya. Everything has become more expensive, harder to come by and more complicated. The young people have started to emigrate. We went up to San Luis where a pirogue was about to set sail. We boarded it, but it got damaged off the coast of Mauritania. So we disembarked there and came home. Then I made a second attempt. And that time I managed to get as far as Tenerife. The Spanish put us in immigration centers, but we were sent home by the Senegalese government. If I get another chance to emigrate, I'm going to take it, because I've been fishing for 28 years now, and I can't make a decent living out of it. An ocean which no longer nourishes people but which people brave because it brings hope of a better life. Every year, hundreds more join the exodus. They leave KR, risking their lives to see what lies on the other side of the horizon. Periods of celebration, such as Ramadan, place an extra financial burden on the people of Kaar. In this mostly Wolof region, members of the Muslim Brotherhood, Ba'i Fal, go round the streets begging for alms as a sign of humility and solidarity with the poorest. This cult, that is close to Sufism, advocates indifference to all material possessions. A Ba'i Fal ceremony is organized every Thursday at Eliman's house. Hello, everyone. How are you? Abdullahi? Galgu? How are you, my brother? You're already dressed? The sea wasn't bad today, but there were no fish. I'm going to get ready for the ceremony. After his second attempt to emigrate, Eliman's wife left with his two children. He finds comfort in his family and the solidarity of the Baifal Brotherhood. Mamshir, where's your black and white robe? Here, put this on. Mamshir has a rosary. Go and bind the tom tom. Not all at once. Gently. Gently. Being Baifal gives me a certain sense of well-being. I'm happy to be Baifal. Being Baifal means I can put up with a lot. It teaches you patience. 
Being by foul means being tolerant. We don't have much, but we try to be happy with what we have. It's another dimension to life. Should they hold out and stay in Senegal, or leave and tempt fate? Eliman and his friend Galgu, who lost his leg in a fishing accident, are torn between these two choices. To discuss it, they are meeting with a very special woman, Yai Bayam Duf. She was the first woman in her village to earn a living from fishing, and she fights a constant battle with this clandestine migration which claimed her only child. My son, along with 80 of his friends, took a boat to Europe in search of some human dignity. His hope evaporated along with mine because he was lost at sea. It was difficult. It was very hard for me. The disappearance of my son was a trigger for me. We need credible alternatives if we are to keep our young people in our country. That's when I decided we needed to create economic opportunities for these youngsters. Yei Bayam Duf had no income after her son died, so, aged over 50, she learned to fish. She then went on to set up a fish farm. Today, she employs young people, and teaches them about sustainable fishing. Hello, everyone. How are you, madam? Well, thanks. What's your name? Yayi Bayamdouf. I'm from Thierry Sommer. Oh, yes, I've heard of you. You're like a big sister to us, and that's a really good thing. People say that what leads you into the darkness can also teach you how to come out the other side. Yes. I held a session to raise awareness in schools. I asked one pupil, do you know the sea they call the Mediterranean? And he said, yes, that's where our parents go to die. Imagine a child growing up with such an idea that the Mediterranean is no longer a bridge between Africa and Europe, but rather a human cemetery. It's a tragedy, a real tragedy. We have to stop now and rethink things. We must believe in ourselves, in our country. Why risk death to seek work elsewhere? These people in Europe are not extraordinary. They are no cleverer than we are. They are just better organized. Look at all the fish processing plants here. They are all run by foreigners. We go out to sea and do all the hard work. We bring in our catch and then we flog it to them. They process it and export it. I bring back a product, but that's not enough. I need to add value to it so I can sell it for a higher price. Wherever there is water, sunshine and the strength to work, there can be development. A dialogue has opened up between this woman, who brings a message of hope, and the fisherman, about the survival of the fishing industry in KR in this changing world. Rather than leave their country, lots of fishermen have chosen to migrate to the south and the Petite Kurt, which starts in Dakar and extends as far as the Saloum River Delta. Beyond that, and up to the border with Gambia, never-ending ocean inlets wind their way inland. The region of Sini Saloon covers 180,000 hectares of land and water, broken up into thousands of sandy islands. It's a maze of mangrove swamps and belongs. These meandering ocean inlets have for thousands of years been home to the Neominka Serer people, otherwise known as the Serer Delta people. <laughs> Mariama has spent her whole life in the delta. Every day, she and a group of friends wait for low tide to go and harvest oysters, which they sell for a living.
When we're harvesting oysters, we have to be careful because they are sharp and we don't want to cut our fingers. We used to cut off the whole branch, but when you cut off the whole branch, there are no oysters left to reproduce. So now we take a knife and cut them off gently, one by one. It's important that our children and grandchildren can do as our mothers did and as we're doing and continue to make a living here. If we destroy the lot, what will they find here? We must preserve it. Once they've been boiled, shucked and dried, the oysters will be consumed on the spot or sold at the market by Mariama's friends. For thousands of years, shellfish have been at the heart of Serra culture. Their consumption by dozens of consecutive generations and the tons of shells produced by these eating habits have led to a transformation of the landscape of the Saloom Delta. This artificial island emerging from the mangrove swamp is in fact a giant pile of shells 12 hectares wide on which baobab trees have sprung up. Piles of shells, such as this one, served as burial grounds for the Serer people up until the last century. Mariama comes here regularly to pray. This island has been here for thousands of years. It's a very important place in Serra culture. The reason all these shells are here is that the Delta people made a living from fishing for mussels, shellfish and oysters. There are also shells from the fruit of the baobab trees. All these shells served as burial mounds or tombs for our ancestors. All their possessions were placed in their tombs with them. They were buried with all their belongings. For example, their bracelets and pieces of pottery, sometimes even bones. This is where people come to pray for their ancestors. It's a religious place, a place of prayer. It's a very sacred place for us. Mariama has finished praying and hurries home to the village of Bambuga. Mariama has invited her nephew Aliu over, together with his staff, his coach and his training partner. Aliu works as a farmer for the rest of the year, but during the dry season he makes a living as a wrestler. He and his team cross the region, going from fight to fight, finding lodgings wherever they can. You can leave your luggage here. Here, hold it like this. Aliu has just won the last two tournaments and he has a fight tomorrow on the outskirts of Bambuga. Right, it's ready. 
I'll put that there. Mariama is married, but she has chosen to live alone with her children and grandchildren. It's an unusual situation in Serer society, where the men, many of whom are polygamous, are traditionally the head of the family. Lower your gaze in front of the adults and stop making a pig of yourself. Eat properly. My husband and his two wives live in their big house. But I live in my house. I'm unusual because I am submissive, but not overly submissive. <laughs> How are you feeling about tomorrow's fight? I'm on form. God willing. I've done all I had to do. Do you plan to train on the day of the match? Yes, tomorrow I'll train before the match. I need to warm up my muscles. Otherwise, I'll make a wrong move. Mm. Small errors happen when you don't warm up properly. Let's go. Go on. Stay on the line. Stay on the line. Right. We've done enough stretching and endurance work. Let's work on your contact. Go on, pick up the pace. That's it! <laughs> the Sini Saloon region is the birthplace of Senegalese wrestling. The wrestlers try to floor their adversary, in other words, to make him fall onto his hands and knees or to force his head, his back or his bottom to touch the ground. Alaji, you need to attack. And Ailu, you need to be tougher. In traditional wrestling, blows are forbidden. What separates the wrestlers is strength, weight, and endurance. I chose this sport because I'm Sarah. Wrestling is in our tradition. That's why I started doing it, and I've made a success of it. That's important to me because I'm a father. You can win sacks of rice and money. I take all that home with me to help my family. I want to be a great champion. I think I have the size and the strength to be successful in the arena. It's my dream to become a professional Senegalese wrestler. The champions of Senegalese wrestling often have a background in traditional wrestling, like Aliou. Their status in Senegal is akin to that of our football stars. Their preparation is mystical as well as physical, with the inevitable visit from the village Marabou before the match. Hello? Hello. Master, we've come to ask for your blessing for the coming fight. Where will the fight take place? It will take place in the village of Liran, when? today. You brought me luck for my last fight. I beat my adversary in the village of Ngo. Thank you for that. We have great confidence in you. It is I who should thank you for your financial contribution to the construction of our mosque. We are here to help. A marabou is someone who assists people with the help of the surah in the Quran. 
Aru can't just go off and fight. He must be protected from bad luck. I'm going to pray for him and give him some purified water with the Quran. That will help him. I'm also going to give him some charms to make him stronger. The Marabu has written down some surah and angel's names on a piece of paper. He then folds it to make a charm or talisman. He also gives Aliu bottles of water, purified by the Quran and mixed with roots. Aliu will take what is known as a mystical bath in it later. In Senegal, Marabus are both spiritual guides and medicine men. This evening, the men put on a show of bravery, cheered on by local women dressed in their finery and griots singing a litany of praises. The fight started at around midnight. The final will be held at about three in the morning. Aliu, because he won his two previous trophies, is already through to the quarterfinals in his heavyweight category. The winner of tonight's tournament will win two cows. It is the best prize a farmer can get. The fight can last for two rounds of 10 minutes and can go into extra time, after which it will be decided on points awarded by the referee. Aliou's adversary has just blinded him. That's a foul, which will cost him the match after the regulation time. Aliou has won on points. That means he is through to the semi-finals and will be up against an adversary who is much heavier than him. A mountain of muscles in full mystical preparation mode. I pushed him with all my might, but he wrong-footed me. He toppled me thanks to his weight and I fell to the ground. Obviously it hurts to lose, but that's the law of sport. There has to be a winner and a loser. I'm going to carry on training. I'll carry on the fight. The rainy season is approaching. 
Soon, Alio will return to the fields. Another fight will begin to extract enough from nature to feed his family. It's the common fate of so many Senegalese people, whether they are farmers, fishermen, or salt miners in Palmera in northern Saloum. The changing colors are created by cyanobacteria, microscopic organisms which produce a pigment to help them survive the presence of salt. The biggest of these Senegalese salt mines is situated north of Dakar, Lake Retba, better known as Lac Rose or Pink Lake. Usman has been doing the painful job of salt scraping for the past 20 years. Every day, he goes out onto the lake to load up his boat, while his wife, helped by a friend, unloads the boat he filled up yesterday. I'm piling up salt under my feet. I make several movements to separate it from the mud. The more movements I make, the whiter the salt is. I am the only local man still working on the lake. A lot of immigrants come here from Mali or Guinea to work. But the Senegalese don't want to put their feet in the lake to extract salt. The crystals cut your skin. It burns and leaves scars. You can't work here without suffering the consequences. The day seems interminable under the burning sun. Usman will carry on until he has filled his boat up to the waterline. The salt I've just unloaded will give us enough to survive on for two days. I say survive because if I buy enough food to live well, it will only last one day. I used to be a farmer. For a long time I grew millet and rice. But then the drought came and farming wasn't lucrative enough anymore, so I had to look for something else. So I became a weaver. But because of competition, the price of cloth plummeted. So, then I decided to come to Lac Rose to be a salt scraper. This lake has brought me luck. And I love it, because I had nothing when I came here. I found work here, and I met my wife and started a family here. I've done many things in the past that haven't always worked out. But this place has allowed me to earn a living. Usman goes home to his wife and children. 
Tomorrow he will resume uncomplainingly what others call slave labor and what he simply calls earning a living. It's a daily lesson in resilience and courage by the last Senegalese salt scraper of Lac Rose. In a world that is in a state of flux, Usman and all the sentinels of the water are holding out and fighting for the survival of their heritage.